Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? So aloha, good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Sugidono, and I'm going to be your MC for tonight. This month, we are joined by Professor Mark Hickson of the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And tonight, his talk is titled, Who Will Save Hawaii's Coral Reef Saviors? Um, so reefs with herbivores or fish that eat seaweed recover much more rapidly than degraded reefs and these herbivores are so critical to protecting our reefs from seaweed overgrowth yet so many of these species are overfished near human population centers so without these very without these valuable herbivores our reef ecosystem could collapse however if we act now it's possible to replenish these populations and create hope for our reefs. And so the, the, that's what Mark is going to be talking about tonight. Um, tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean speaker series. And it's always held on the first Wednesday of every month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. And this monthly series is uh, supported by the County of Maui, so mahalo to them for helping to make tonight's talk possible. And as a quick side note, if you aren't already signed up for our e-newsletter, The Reef in Brief, um, I encourage you to go ahead and do so. This is where we announce the, the registration for all of our talks, updates on our work, and any in-person events or volunteer days. So if you enjoyed tonight's talk and want to be, be here for next month, then go ahead and sign up. The link for that will be in the chat, and you can stay up to date on our most recent speakers. So who are we? Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we work for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish. And we've been doing this since its inception in 2007. And we believe that healthy coral reefs mean healthy communities and that every living thing in Maui is connected. So we protect the reefs by focusing all of our assessment, monitoring, and restoration efforts from Malka to Makai. And working Maka to Makai means that we work on land as well as in the ocean throughout the year. Um, we do many different things. Some of those things, a few of them are we test water quality at over 39 locations across the island. We regularly monitor local fish and reef populations through uh, monitoring dives. And we provide training to property owners and landscaping professionals on how to use natural alternatives to toxic herbicides and pesticides. Um, we're very excited to have our certification program launching soon, so keep an eye out for that. And we're a really small team, but we're dedicated to preserving our island home. And we can only do this because of you, our community, who generously support our work. Um, so you can make sure that this is we're able to continue by making a donation using the link in the chat, or you can just go to MauiReefs.org. And we appreciate every expression of aloha that you guys give to us. So thank you so much. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get to our speaker. We will have time at the end for question and answer. So please hold your questions until, well, you don't have to hold them. Please use the Zoom Q&A function at any time during the presentation. You can submit your questions. Uh, we'll keep a running list. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to comment and those questions will be relayed to me. And at the end, we will read them aloud and have Mark answer as many of them as we can as time permits. Um, we're also recording this presentation, um, and it is, like I mentioned, being streamed to Facebook Live. So the recording will be available on our YouTube channel in a few days. And we do send out uh, an email with the link to the replay. So again, another reason if you have to jump off early or you want to forward it to a friend, jump on our e-newsletter sign up and you'll be notified when that is ready. Okay, so now for our speaker, we are so excited to have Professor Mark Hickson with us tonight. Mark is a professor and the Hisao Endowed Chair in Marine Biology in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He completed his graduate work at the University of California at Santa Barbara and is the past chair of both the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA, and the Ocean Sciences Advisory Committee for the National Science Foundation, also known as NSF. And in addition to teaching, Mark presently serves on the Scientific Advisory Committees for the NOAA Coral Reef Program, 
the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument and the Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources, among others. And trust me, people, that was a very short snippet of the many things that Mark has done. I had to condense it for time, but we are so excited to have you, Mark. Thank you for being with us. And the floor is yours. Well, mahalo, Sarah. And mahalo to all of you for being here with me this evening. Um, I want to say right up front that that my heart goes out to Maui for what you've all been having to endure since the fires. It was um, devastating for people who don't live on Maui as well. And um, I wish everyone the very best. So these fish that I study, I, I started working on these fish called herbivores in Hawaii in the late 1970s, actually, and I've been studying them on and off ever since. And over that time, I mean, it's a long time now, we're talking going on 50 years, I've seen the changes in these populations and it's been of great concern to me as well as many of my colleagues, which is why I wanna speak about them tonight. So who will save Hawaii's coral reef saviors? Let's first take a little walk into the future because being able to see what's coming down the tracks at us will help us put into perspective, I believe, what we need to do for our reefs. So a typical healthy coral reef in Hawaii has corals that um, are kind of tinged greenish or mustard color, and that's because they have little symbiotic plant-like microbes that live in their tissues. The coral is actually a combination of an animal and a plant. And that enables corals to grow in a healthy way and create these reefs with all the wonderful benefits they provide for human beings. Unfortunately, we're starting more and more frequently to see what's called coral bleaching where the water becomes too warm because of climate disruption and ocean warming. And um, the corals lose their symbionts. And if the water doesn't get cool again soon, the coral will die. And unfortunately, the models predict that by about the year 2040, we can expect to see Hawaii's coral reefs bleach every single year. And that is really scary to those of us who love coral reefs. Now, once coral dies, if it's by bleaching or anything else, typically it will crumble into rubble and end up being covered by seaweed, unless these fish I'm talking about are in great abundance and great diversity. So if we're proactive, we can help to prevent the decline and degradation of our reefs that's going to be threatened by an ever warming ocean. So there's the context for the future. Now, if we look at the past, we can learn some things about how our coral reefs work that really show the importance of these herbivorous fish, who I will introduce a bit later. This is a recent study just published from the Big Island on the Kohala Kona coast, and it followed the trajectory for about a decade, the amount of um, the percent change in coral cover of a, of a series of reefs. And you can see about half the reefs had increasing coral cover over 10 years up to 2014, and the other half were getting worse through time. So they examined all the factors that accounted for these differences. And they found two things. One in particular, the reefs with a positive trajectory of increasing coral abundance had lots of these herbivores. And the different kinds of herbivores, which I'll introduce later, scrapers, browsers, and grazers, as well as all herbivores combined. The coral reefs had relatively few of these fish, and they also had for water quality to a great extent. Then in 2015, we had what's been the worst coral bleaching event 
so far in Hawaii. Um, we had another bleaching event in 2019, and since then, we've been very lucky. I want to note that for the last three years, Hawaii has been in cool water conditions because of the ocean climate system. So we've had a little bit of a reprieve from this bleaching, but it will be coming back. In 2015, we saw many of these reefs decline in their coral cover. So each one of these lines represents the percent cover of live coral before the bleaching event versus after the bleaching event. And what was telling was the reefs where there were lots of herbivores and clean enough water. And what you can see with those black lines is those reefs didn't change very much. The reefs with the abundant herbivores had the greatest coral survival. Very important for getting through the future. So in a very real way, these herbivorous fish, and every fish in this photo except one is an herbivore, are the savers of our reefs. They keep dead surfaces clean so new corals can settle and grow, regardless of what causes the death of the corals, as long as it's not being buried in sediment. Now, our, our saviors, because they eat what we call benthic algae in the scientific community, seaweeds by almost everyone else. And if you like diagrams, um, this is what's called an interaction web in science. You have the herbivores that eat the seaweeds, which would otherwise smother the corals. So it's a situation where my enemy's enemy is my friend, that is the herbivores benefit the corals. They're not actually trying to, they're just eating the seaweeds, but in doing so, they benefit the seaweeds. Now the corals in turn, of course, oops, benefit the herbivores by providing shelter. And in fact, the corals themselves provide the structure of the reef and provide habitat for all the other species on the reef. So a healthy reef, as you can see, is really a positive feedback loop, a loop that's self-reinforcing. The herbivores keep the reef clean so the corals can grow, the corals provide shelter for the herbivores, and everyone lives happily ever after. The problem arises when we break that positive feedback loop, and that happens when we take too many herbivores out of the system. So you can imagine the change that takes place where now the herbivores, instead of being abundant, are not abundant. So the seaweeds are allowed to take over the reef and eventually smother the corals, especially if there's anything that causes mortality in the corals. So our choice is lots of herbivores and lots of coral or basically a lot of seaweed. So just to drive this home one more time, more herbivores means more coral and less algae. Fewer herbivores means less coral and more algae. And I'm not just talking about limu that people eat. I'm talking about the kind of gnarly stuff that nobody's particularly interested in. Now, I want to take a little break here to introduce the herbivores and emphasize that just as we need many different kinds of tools to maintain a healthy garden, we need many different kinds of herbivores to maintain a healthy coral reef. And that's because the different species of herbivore eat different algae and they eat algae in different ways. So it's that combination of many species that keeps our reef sufficiently clean to allow corals to thrive. So there's several groups that have been identified and the fish don't know what group they're in. Sometimes they actually go back and forth between groups, depending upon their behavior and, and their age and size. So number one, the heavy lifters are the scrapers. Um, these are the ones when they get large, actually scrape into the dead coral surfaces, swallow that dead coral and end up pooping sand. In fact, these are major sand providers for our reefs, a large, Uhu can produce upwards of 800 pounds of sand a year. So these are our natural sand producers on our reefs. So there's two large species of Uhu, uh, the ember and the spectacled. 
these are the ones that are currently subject to special rules on Maui, and I'll get to those a little later. But like all Uhu, they tend to start, or not tend to, they mostly start life as females. And then when they reach a certain size under the right social conditions, they may change into a male and change color dramatically. Scientists used to actually think these are different species, but here's a female and a male of an ember. You can see very different in appearance and of a spectacle as well. So these are the, the fabled blue uhu that you may be hearing about. There's also smaller species, five smaller species in Hawaii, um, pale nose, star eye, regals, bullet heads, and yellow bar. So when these fish are large, they scrape into the substrate and we sometimes call them um, excavators. But in general, because they have fused teeth, that's why they're called parrot fish, they look like they have parrot beaks, they scrape the dead surfaces of the, of the coral and eat the, the, the small algae that's growing there, sometimes actually inside the dead coral as well. The next group is the browsers. These are fish that eat the larger seaweeds, the, the larger macroalgae, as we call them. And that includes the chubs, the nanui, as well as the unicorn fishes, most popular one being hala, or the unicorn fish. You can see that nice unicorn on the head. My granddaughter loves those things. Then there's the grazers. These are mostly uh, surgeon fishes in Hawaii various species, um, common species. Some have been um, taken down, others are, are doing quite well, includes the Manini and, and others. The last group are what we call the detritivores. These are the uh, cole, which have very fine teeth, kind of like little combs, and they just sort of brush smaller algae off larger algae, as well as the detritus involved. So they're the really fine scale herbivores in our system. So lots of diversity, all of them feed in slightly different ways. I should mention that the, um, the grazers are eating the um, turf algae, the low lying algae that grows on the reefs, as opposed to the large macroalgae that the browsers go after. So all those different tools keep our reefs clean. Now, unfortunately, I'm not pointing fish, fingers at anyone in particular, but there's too many people taking too many herbivores in many parts of our islands. It's not everywhere, as I'm about to show you, but there are places where there's extreme overfishing. This especially occurs on my island, um, Oahu, where people go out at night and basically clear a reef, as you can see in this photo. That is, they're spearing the uhu while they're sleeping helplessly under ledges. There are many Pono fishermen. I am not against fishing. I fish myself. But we need to see what's going on with the status of our, of our herbivore stocks. So this is a very important study, another new study recently published that looked at the abundance of herbivores on each and every moku, each and every district, on the main Hawaiian islands. And you can see in the map, they're coded here both by number as well as by color. The reds are the lowest abundances, my island, Oahu, and a couple locations in Maui and Kauai. The gray is sort of intermediate abundances and the blue are relatively high abundances of these fish. So this is the abundance of these fish in each one of the moku. And this is from thousands of transects run by scientists in these areas. This is not a small sample size over many years. So a couple things I want you to notice. One is the broad range, the Ho'olave, um, the Kona side has the highest abundance as one would expect. Very few, if any people fish there. The worst sites are mostly on Oahu. Let's look at Maui in particular, since most of you are probably from Maui. These stars indicate the moku of Maui, the 13 moku. And what you see is there's a very broad range on Maui. Some parts of Maui are doing quite well in herbivore abundances. Others are doing quite poorly. In fact, 
for Lahaina had very low herbivore abundance even before the fires. So recovery is going to take a long time at that reef. Now, we know that this abundance of herbivores is not caused by pollution for a couple reasons. One is that in this same study, they examined all the factors that are correlated with the abundance of these fish, everything from water quality to habitat to um, um, fishing intensity, everything you could imagine. And what they found was that the moku here with lots of sort of mustard color underneath them are, are the moku where fishing is definitely one of the most important factors determining the abundance of herbivores. And so what you can see, these are the red starred moku, that's that six of the 13 moku around Maui are considered to be pretty badly overfished. Another line of evidence that it's not caused by pollution is when we compare all the moku, each one of these dots is a different moku, and we look at the abundance of fish that are resource fish, that is fish that are fished, versus fish that are not fish, the non-resource fish, as a function of how many people are in that moku, we see that there's a decline in the abundance of fish that are fished, but importantly, no change in the abundance of non-resource fish. If pollution was driving the pattern, we'd, we'd expect all fish to decline in abundance, not just the ones that people like to eat. So we know fishing is an issue in some locations. So the question then comes down to which path is Hawaii going to choose? Are we going to do what's needed to make sure that there's lots of herbivores of many different species on these reefs? Or are we going to go the other direction and continue in some locations to overfish these animals and help drive our reefs into oblivion, especially as coral bleaching becomes more and more pronounced in coming years. So here I want to look at, and this will be the most the rest of the talk, I want to look at sort of the rise and fall of herbivore protections in Hawaii. And the reason I want to lead you through this is that Hawaii or Maui right now is in the process of determining um, ocean management for your island. And you, the people of Maui, have choices to make about what's going to be important and what you're going to do. Now, I don't live on your island, so I'm not telling you what to do. What I'm here to do is show you data from the past as well as various and sundry things that have been going on with management, and you can make your own choices. But there's been a pattern where there's been, through time, more and more protections of herbivores, and then suddenly less and less protections that have taken place. So it started for herbivores back in the year 2000, almost a quarter of a century ago, when the West Maui established a series of fish replenishment areas, mostly targeting the aquarium trade, but most of the catch was actually yellow tang and herbivore. Then in 2009 in West Maui, the Kahekili herbivore fishery management area was established. The Maui rules for Uhu were established in 2014. I'll go over all these. Then Governor Ige proposed the 30 by 30 initiative, which I'll also explain in 2016. And finally, in late 2022, uh, the state proposed statewide rules for the fishing of herbivores to ensure that there's plenty of herbivores for the future. Well, that was sort of the peak. Thereafter, a number of things happened. First, there was a change in administration and the 30 by 30 initiative was abandoned in the sense that the target of 30% protection of our state waters by 2030 was abandoned. The process has been renamed and it's continuing, but it's not focusing in particular 
on this target any longer. The final statewide herbivore rules were passed just in December, and um, they're not nearly as strong as the originally proposed rules. I'll go over that. Then in just this legislative session, there was a bill to ban the spearing of Uhu parrotfish at night, which was killed at its first committee meeting. And so it's gone. And so now the question is, are we going to stay down here or are we going to take steps to, to bring the protections back up to snuff so that we will have plenty of herbivores for the future? So at this point, you know, if, if you've heard enough, you might want to log off because what I intend to do for the rest of my time is go over each one of these steps in a little bit of detail to show you um, what has happened and why, what has worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past as hopefully guidance for all of us for the future. So let's start in West Hawaii with the fish replenishment areas. Again, these were established in the year 2000 after a two year process that was community driven. Um, the West Hawaii Fisheries Council involved all interested citizens including the aquarium fishery itself. Um, it was started because there was a noticeable decline in yellow tang, Awilala, that, um, that um, people were noticing and they were concerned that there was too many fish being taken by the aquarium industry. So everyone got together and they established nine fisheries replenishment areas along the coast that covered 35% of the West Hawaii coastline. The fishery bought into it. That is, they would not do aquarium fishery in these areas. So these were not entirely closed areas. They were closed to one activity, aquarium fishing. Now, if you look what happened subsequently, we see a success story. And that's all these curves on this graph. So let me lead you through these one at a time. So the blue curve represents areas that were protected from aquarium fishing for a long time. So this was sort of a, you know, this is what happens if you don't have aquarium fishing. The green areas are areas that were open to aquarium fishing. And as you'd expect, there'd be fewer yellow tang in those areas. The red areas are these fisheries replenishment areas. And what you can see is that within less than a decade, these areas after being protected went and became as abundant as fully protected areas and stayed that way for the rest of the study. The fishery bought into it. There was no poaching to speak of. There was a little bit, but you know, people obeyed the rules and it worked. Now, what good is that unless it helps the fishery? Well, as you can see, the abundance of fish that in the areas that were being fished also increased through time as fish increased in the FRAs. And this is because of two reasons that have been scientifically documented I won't get into. One is the spillover of fish. The fish built up in these areas and started going outside their boundaries where people caught more fish than they used to. And also these fishery punishment areas became sources of fish larvae, lots of spawning going on in these areas. And we actually traced the movements of the larvae and showed that the FRAs were actually replenishing areas outside their boundaries. So it worked. So let's go to Maui and the Kahikili Herbivore Fisheries Management Area that was established in 2009. This, this particular area had mixed results and it seemed to be a function of how intensively managed the area was. So you can see once the area was closed, that's this Daurica line, Uhu um, increased in abundance through time, as did surgeon fish. Everything was going great guns. In fact, even though coral was still declining through time, the abundance of what's called Crestos coralline algae, which is a very important settlement habitat for coral larvae, increased through time and the abundance of macroalgae um, went down through time. So the reef was starting to recover. 
But then the COVID pandemic hit, and by all accounts, the level of enforcement declined and the level of poaching increased through time. So the system went back down, and in fact, the abundance of Crestos coralline algae went back down since the, since the pandemic. So it showed that these things work when everything's in place and people are obeying the law and there's plenty of enforcement and education, but it can break down very easily. Okay, what about the Maui Uhu rules? These were established in 2014 to prevent this extreme overfishing and overtake of Uhu. Um, and this prevented or prohibited the fishing of large blue Uhu of the two largest species, um, a larger size limit for the female Uhu, and um, a take of only two Uhu per day. Now, DAR has been, um, Division of Aquatic Resources has started to analyze these data, but frankly, they haven't gone enough into the future. This is, these are some recent analyses looking at the abundance of Uhu at different locations around Maui. So the points are just different points through time, and then the curves are associated with fitting these different points. And you can see there really hasn't been much change so far, but this really isn't a long enough of a time frame. The, the rules were put in place in 2014. The data go up only three years, 2017. And that's about the, um, that's about the generation time of Uhu. So there's been very little change in the stock so far. Time will tell whether this will be sufficient to bring up the Uhu populations. But a recent quote by Dar said that strict fishing rules can help prevent further declines, but they're not likely to help rebuild the stocks, at least as far as this has gone so far, maybe not in the future. Okay, what about this 30 by 30 thing? So in 2016, Governor Ige proposed the Sustainable Hawaii Initiative. In the marine realm, the idea or the target was for 30% of near shore marine areas to be effectively managed by the year 2030. This is actually an international movement. Uh, many nations, in fact, the US federal government has adapted it, um, um, and many nations around the world are, are, are going for this particular goal. But with a change in administration, this target was abandoned in 2023. The program is still in existence. It's now called the Holomua program. Um, there is no target per se, but DAR is going from island to island and helping each island establish its own marine management tools, marine management rules and regulations. So as part of this Holomua process, DAR wanted to start with statewide rules for herbivores in particular, understanding how important they are, number one, and number two, how, um, how uh, depleted they are in many parts of the state. Again, this is to prevent serious plundering of our reefs. This just happened a week or so ago on Oahu, a guy fishing at night, taking undersize as well as too many kala when the present laws, you can take only two, for example. So I'm not gonna go through all these rules. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can stop and read them, but the proposed rules were fairly substantial and helped to, um, to help to bring back herbivores everywhere. So these rules um, first proposed in December, 2022, went out for public comment there was a lot of pushback over the ensuing year, and DAR kept ratcheting down the rules each time they were um, opposed. And so the final rules um, saw quite a bit of change in these rules. Some were not changed, or the ones that listed as no change. Some of them were just basically not implemented. That's the status quo. And then some of the bag limits were increased a certain amount of time, and the, the cut and allowable catch was was of um, 
Uhu was not particularly um, strong. So those of us who study these things have looked at these rules and we're not convinced that these small incremental rules are going alone to bring back our herbivore populations, especially in the, the severely depleted realms. They're incremental changes, they'll help a little bit, but remember we've got this freight train of coral bleaching heading down the tracks at us. We need to bring these fish back more quickly than this. So after these rules were proposed or the last of the final rules were passed, um, people who were concerned um, um, convinced um, Representative Nicole Lowen of the Big Island to um, propose a bill to prevent the spearing of Uhu at night or prohibit the spearing of Uhu at night, which would bring back Uhu more rapidly. Um, the DOCARE, the enforcement branch of the Division of Land and Natural Resources suggests that there should also be a ban on selling commercially speared Uhu because lots of people don't obey the law. Um, anyway, that bill died in its first committee hearing. It died when the committee chair said, I don't think the legislature should be involved in natural resource management. That should be done by the Division of Land and Aquatic Resources, or Dan, Land and Natural Resources. Um, not everybody agrees with that, but that bill died. So that's where we are right now. There is a resolution in the um, state legislature right now to encourage um, DAR and to work with the federal government and other experts to start addressing the very severely depleted herbivore populations around the island of Oahu sooner than later. And otherwise, we'll, we'll see what happens with the Olumua process on, on Maui and then the other islands. So here are my conclusions. First, um, herbivores are essential for the survival of our coral reefs. That's not only been documented in, in Hawaii, but it's been documented around the world. Herbivores are overfished in many locations, in some locations anyway, severely in some. Neither the land board nor the legislature has been willing so far to protect the herbivores sufficiently to recover their populations. So it's up to the Division of Aquatic Resources working with communities to see if they can can up the ante a little bit to bring these fish back sooner than later. We know from both Kahikili before the COVID pandemic, as well as the Big Island, that marine protected areas for fisheries do work in Hawaii as they do elsewhere in the world. And my personal opinion is that they should be part of the solution. Lots of people hate closed areas, but they can be done expeditiously in the right areas, not, not um, prohibiting everything, but maybe, you know, this area seems to be low on kala. Let's have no take kala in that particular area or whatever it is. They can be custom designed to be part of the solution as well. In any case, I and my colleagues strongly believe that if we, unless we start treating the herbivore losses as a crisis requiring emergency actions, we will eventually lose many of our coral reefs, which would be a severe tragedy for our entire state. So which path will Hawaii choose? Only time will tell. Thank you for listening. Mahalo. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate uh, that very, very concise and um, thorough presentation. That that it's a kind of a bleak picture. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, but it's the truth. Um, we'd rather want we'd rather know what the actual state of it is so we can address it. Um, but it's not too late. I want to emphasize that. <laughs> yeah. No. Right. 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 And that's and that is also that I think that ending portion where you're kind of mentioning like these are the things that have worked in other places or in the past, um, so that there are things that we can do. Kind of 
on that um, topic, just a just a few questions. Most of them are are people saying thank you, um, thank you for sharing um, the, your presentation. So, um, do you aside from the like the strict enforcement of managed areas, like you mentioned, um, I think the graph with the, the COVID chart. You know, are there any other actions or measures that might to help slow the depletion of fish? Well, yes, absolutely. There's many tools in the tools chest. I know right now with the Holomua process on Maui, they're looking at bag limits. Bag limits are very helpful. Bag limits only work if people obey the law. And there's enforcement for people who don't follow the law. Mm -hmm. So you, you really need to have a lot of education involved with these kinds of tools, as well as enforcement. Uh, because there's bad players out there, and there always will be on every island. <laughs> I'm not picking on Maui. You know, if 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 the existing rules had just been followed by everybody, we wouldn't be in as bad a state as we are now. So bag limits are one. Um, there's closed seasons when fishes are spawning. Uh, there's a whole variety of tools in the tools chest. Um, another question that just came in. Um, what what do you think is the best way to raise awareness about this issue? Uh, educate, educate, educate is what one of my colleagues once said. Uh, there was down in the corner of my last slide, there was a, a little plug for a public education campaign that I helped to organize called Fish Pono Save Our Reefs. Um, so if you go to fishpono.org, um, you can see what we're trying to do to help educate the public about this issue. And occasionally we run TV advertisements featuring very well-respected people, such as Nainoa Thompson, um, as well as uh, TV spots, um, all by respected people in the community to just call attention to this issue. One of the problems with the whole herbivore issue is people tend to look at it as it's just a fishing issue. Mm. You catch fish and you eat them. Oh, there's not enough fish. Bummer. We'll try to get them back somehow. But these fish are the caretakers of our reefs, <laughs> the saviors of our reefs. So in many places, they're worth much more alive than dead. And I hope people will take that to heart proactively, just as with the Maui fires, you know, if we'd been proactive about non-native grasses before those fires took place, we might have still had Lahaina here. So learning in hindsight is not a good way to do it. And the scientific community is really afraid of hindsight with our reefs. We really don't want to go there. Um, and just for um, everyone, just to call it out, the, the organization that Mark mentioned, Fish Pono, we do have a link um, in the chat if you guys are interested in um, learning more. And they have, they've got social media profiles or on Instagram. So, you know, please feel free to stay updated and follow them um, as well. We've, we've got a few more questions. Um, has enforcement, to your knowledge, has enforcement rebounded to, I guess, pre-COVID um, I don't know, efficacy or just to pre-COVID levels? I know you mentioned there was like a drop off at that point. Do you, to your knowledge, has it improved at all since then? That, that's a great question. I, I'm sure it has since COVID. What, what some of the doe care officers told me was that during COVID, they not only had to wear masks, but they had to wear gloves. And every time they wrote a pen, when they had somebody sign something, they had to throw it away and it just became a hassle. So they, they, they sort of eased off during that time. I know doe care, again, this is the enforcement branch of um, the, the um, uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources. Doe care has some additional funding. They've now got an academy. So they're getting more officers out there. I don't believe there's all that many officers on any island. In fact, um, one doe care officer just told me just a couple days ago that there's only four officers patrolling the entire island of Oahu with a million people. My goodness. So, so there's not enough enforcement. That's why education and I guess you'd call it peer pressure is important as well. Okay. If, there, if there's a worldview shift where it's not Pono to take too many Uhu, 
you know, people will eventually catch on, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do we correct a long history of reactivity to being proactive? And I don't know if the, I, I know you said education. I don't know if there's anything more to that that you feel that can be added. Well, this is, this is the fundamental question. I, I've been involved in ocean conservation issues for decades. I mean, I got started when my favorite coral reef that I was studying in the Bahamas died before my very eyes. Um, all the coral died, all the fish left. And this was a reef where no people were nearby. It was the first global coral bleaching event back in 1997-98. And that redirected my whole career toward conservation. I believe what needs to take place within each individual is not only valuing the, the present time, which we all value, but also valuing the future. If we don't value the future, then we tend to go toward a free for all that ends up depleting our resources and degrading our environment. So in many places, in many cultures, valuing the future is of paramount importance. I know that's true for the native Hawaiian culture. In modern cultures, that view of the future has declined through time as people start to think, where does food come from? It comes from the supermarket. They don't think any further than that. Mm -hmm. So we really need to change that worldview. And that involves people with that worldview sharing it, you know, that the future is as important as the present. One thing I've noticed is it's always easier to talk conservation with people who have children and grandchildren, like I do. Mm -hmm. Always easier because they want a good world for them. Mm -hmm. And that tends to allow people to open their minds a bit and uh, find common ground and reach consensus about what needs to happen. But it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's something, this whole idea about being reactive versus proactive, our our society, humanity has been reactive almost forever. And, if, you know, there's this old saying, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. Right. Well, I do, I've seen reefs die. I don't want to see our reefs die. So I hope we'll get proactive and get lots of herbivores and out there and, and still, um, still get plenty of fish to eat with healthy reefs. Um, one thing people often say is, well, you know, Uhu, people like to eat uhu, so you know we should do that, and we should be able to catch a lot of uhu for, you know, to allow the um, elderly people who can't fish anymore to have fish. Well, there are other fish out there. Um, Conservation International has a program that's been touting um, taape. People see taape as a junk fish. It's actually a delicious fish, and it's very abundant, and it's non-native. And in some places, it seems to be causing problems. So if we can shift our mindsets a little bit, we can bring back these reef saviors and still have plenty of fish to eat. Yeah, yeah. And one uh, comment that came in says, we need to shift our thinking from transactional to generational, like you mentioned, if we're going to be able to see uh, a, 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 re a rebound in these um, fish populations. Absolutely. Um, Another question, uh, there was a mentioned increase in recovery of herbivores during COVID. Was the recovery spatially proportionate throughout the islands or were there spots on the islands which rebounded more quickly than expected? Well, I, I'm not familiar with exactly the patterns that took place on Maui during COVID because I don't live there. I know that on Oahu during COVID, it was interesting lots of people turn to the ocean and start fishing more intensively than before because they could go out alone and stay away from people. But then places that were normally very crowded, such as Hanama Bay, the marine protected area, people stopped going. They even closed Hanama Bay. And what happened is the fish that lived outside in deeper waters of the bay moved inshore and there were tons of fish close to the beach and people were going, oh my God, the fish populations have rebounded. Well, they didn't rebound. They just moved inshore because there weren't any people there. 
<laughs> so those are the two patterns of which I'm aware. Um, are the CVSFAs being monitored with a view to extend their potential ex success to other non-CVSFA areas? So the community-based um, subsistence fisheries um, areas are, I believe, wonderful. It's a, it's turning back to um, more traditional practices of the local community managing its local ocean. Each one has set up its own rules um, with the state. Um, and, you know, East Maui just got its first one. Um, and those the rules are still being developed. Um, and there may be some protected areas in there. There may be open areas. Uh, they're still developing the rules in there. But yes, what is learned from these local communities could certainly apply elsewhere on the islands. Um, people are just going to have to get engaged. One thing I can say, and this is very clear, if, if the majority of people who want positive change, want proactivity, are silent, then you will get nothing but the status quo. Because the people who benefit from the status quo are going to be the only ones speaking up. So I'm not trying to draw lines or battle lines or anything like that. But if you want something, you need to speak up. You need to engage in public processes, hearings, send testimony, that kind of thing. That's what we're encouraging in fishpono.org, where we have little action alerts, things you can do if you wish. To, to help out, but, you know, engage. We have to be engaged citizens if we want positive change. Um, we have another question. Uh, it says, Aloha, Professor Hickson. This is Hiroko. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming Aloha, you Hiroko. Okay. Um, I feel there's not much control by DN DL DLNR, even when we report illegal fishing or overfishing. As you always tell us, it takes the village. Um, is there any movement to put into early childhood education in school curriculum, I guess? I guess talking about that educational piece. You know, that's that's a, a really important idea, Hiroko. So um, let me give you an example. You know, I said there are only four enforcement officers patrolling Oahu. The other night, a friend called me and said, oh, my God, I'm down at our local beach. There's 15 pickup trucks here. 35 guys have gotten out with spearfishing and lights, and they're all going out spearfishing. And so they called DLNR, and DLNR was busy doing other things. So those guys did whatever they did that night on, on, on our local reef. So there isn't enough enforcement. There's no question about that. But um, education at an early level is extremely important. Um, if you're elderly out there, you may remember back in the 70s, if you drove around Oahu, all you saw was litter everywhere, litter from fast foods. I mean, it was just everywhere in the 70s. And because of public education, including in elementary schools, the kids finally shame their parents into stop littering. And littering is no longer Pono anywhere in Hawaii to speak of. So that generational change can take place. And yes, I believe education at all levels, from kindergarten all the way up to the governor, is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, does your organization utilize the conservation grants offered by Maui County? Most recently, I think one had application letter or inquiry deadline extended. I'm assuming that means Fishpono. Does Fishpono utilize any conservation grants? So Fish Pono is we're not an we're not a 501c3, okay? We're just a group of concerned citizens. I mean, and it's been amazing. The volunteers who have come together, filmmakers, web experts, social media experts, it's been great. We got two small grants to get this thing going when the herbivore rules were still sort of up for grads. And this was from the Castle Foundation and the Cook Foundation. Subsequently, we've had some minor donations and our funding's getting close to running out. So we're gonna have to apply for more funds. So um, we wanna keep this going. We believe it's an important part of the overall process. And um, 
we're, we're seeking new funding sources now, but I was not aware of, of the Maui grants, given that we're all based on Oahu. Um, last one, I, we're, yeah, a few more minutes left. Um, there's been reports of people like selling Uhu on social media. Have you heard of this? Have, you know, is anybody aware or doing anything? What, what does that look like? Unfortunately, it's not well regulated. I am aware of Uhu being shipped to the mainland for right. about $70, $70 a pound. So there are people willing to pay top dollar to have fresh Uhu shipped to the mainland. This is a disaster that happens in many fisheries where there are people who have plenty of money are willing to pay almost anything. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you the most classic example. The most beautiful, big, edible fish in the sea, Atlantic bluefin tuna. These beautiful, beautiful fish are sold for top dollar in the Tokyo fish market. And there are fish, individual fish, one fish, that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Once that happens, that fisher is gonna go because mm -hmm. money drives the world. So what part of this change in worldview that needs to take place is valuing these fish as our sand producers, as our reef saviors, more than seeing them as simply food and especially as, as a way just to make a lot of money in a short amount of time. Thank you. Um, so we are, we, we are getting, oh yeah, generational over transactional, it has to happen. And, and it came in. Um, you know, we, we, we are kind of up against that one hour mark. Um, if Mark, is there a way that people have additional questions or that you're, that they're able to contact you? Sure. Absolutely. So, you can, um, if you can read my name there, H-I-X-O-N, you can Google my name and I'll pop up or my email address. If you want to put that in the chat, Sarah, is uh, last name followed by first initial. So Hickson M mm -hmm. at, at hawaii.edu. And I'm happy to take comments or answer questions. And I do please encourage everyone to uh, join fishpona.org and our social media and we'll we'll try to keep you informed of of important things that are happening on this particular front for mother ocean perfect thank you so much mark we, we appreciate your time and answering as uh, more questions than i thought we were going to get thank you very much for taking the time um thank you we're going to wrap things up now um to everybody who attended tonight Mahalo for being with us. Again, mahalo to the County of Maui for supporting um, this series. Our next Know Your Ocean speaker series will feature, uh, next month will feature Mary Hagedorn, and she is the Senior Research Scientist at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. She'll be sharing uh, the work that she's been doing around coral cryopreservation, so keep an eye out for our Reef and Brief, like I mentioned earlier, if you're not signed up to receive our It's Once a Month <laughs> e-newsletter, um, please go ahead and do so, and you will be notified when registration for that is ready. Um, if you'd like to support our work, again, please feel free to uh, visit us at MauiReefs.org, um, or you can use the link in the chat to support us. Mahalo. Uh, for all that you guys do for us. And if you've missed any of tonight's presentation, like we mentioned earlier, it is being recorded. It's actually on Facebook now. So if you want to go ahead and pop over there, it'll be on our Facebook page. But we will also email the replay in a few days and it will be available on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and you can follow us on social media for more news and updates. And of course, last but not least, mahalo to our sponsors, to our supporters. Um, and to donors like you and just people who who come on every single month. Uh, you know, we do this for you guys and we're so happy to have you as a part of our community. So mahalo for letting us serve you. Um, you guys are what makes everything possible. So ahui ho everyone. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you all in May. And thank you, Mark. Mahalo once again. We hope you have a wonderful evening, everybody. Take care. Aloha.